Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Wall, the Deputy Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives for today's program about two brothers during the Vietnam War. Uh, in addition to you, those of you here in the auditorium, we have a wider audience on C-SPAN and YouTube, and I welcome you as well. Before we hear from our guest speakers, I'd like to tell you about a few, about a lot of programs uh, that we have planned for you this week. We open our new exhibit, Remembering Vietnam, this Friday, November 10th. That day, we'll also present six programs, I'm sorry, three programs. Uh, two authors will be here to talk about and sign their books, Six Years in the Hanoi Hilton, and Women Vietnam Veterans, Our Untold Story. Later in the afternoon on Friday, members of the North Carolina Vietnam Helicopters Pilots Association will share their memories of their Vietnam experiences and tell us about the three Bell helicopters that are currently um, parked outside of our, our building. Then on Saturday, November 11th, we'll present three more programs relating to the exhibit. First, Francis O'Rourke Dowell will help us see the Vietnam war through the eyes of a child as she discusses her book, Shooting the Moon. Later in the afternoon, we'll show the film, We Were Soldiers. And in the evening, we'll celebrate the 35th anniversary of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial with a panel discussion that will include the founder of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, Jan Scruggs. To find out the exact schedule and learn more about all of our programming, um, consult our monthly calendar of events online at archives.gov. Another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of our National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports our work here at the Archives, especially education and outreach programs like these. Um, you can pick up an application for membership in the lobby or online. So our new exhibit, Remembering Vietnam, um, it's a media-rich exploration of the Vietnam War. Along with historical analysis, it features interviews of Americans and Vietnamese veterans and civilians who had firsthand experience in the war. And it really is a fascinating collection of both newly discovered and iconic um, original documents, images, film footage, and other material um, organized around 12 critical episodes or moments in the war, um, which, of course, divided uh, the peoples of both the United States and Vietnam. Many of those who've served in the military and gone through combat together refer to their comrades as brothers. And today we are privileged to have, um, to hear from two Vietnam veterans who are both comrades in arms and brothers, Chuck Hagel and Tom Hagel. Both volunteered to go to war and fought in the same army infantry unit. In Our Year of War, Daniel Bolger recounts their journey from middle America to Vietnam at the height of the war and then home again. As we observe the 50th anniversary of the war, we're pri privileged to hear from these two eyewitnesses. The author, Daniel P. Bol Daniel P. Bolger, served in the US Army for 35 years, retiring as a lieutenant general. He commanded troops in both Afghanistan and Iraq, earning five Bronze Star medals, one for valor, and the Combat Action Badge. He's a contributing editor for Army Magazine and is the author of eight other books. He currently teaches history at North Carolina State University. Chuck Hagel has long served our country. He was the Secretary of Defense from 2013 to 2015, and before that, a US Senator from his home state of Nebraska. During the Vietnam War, he served in combat as a Sergeant in the US Army and earned two Purple Hearts, the Combat Infantryman Badge and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. After graduating from the University of Nebraska at Omaha, he worked as a congressional staff assistant, co-founded co Vanguard Cellular, served as the deputy head of the US Veterans Administration, and became the president and chief executive officer of the USO. He's the author of America, Our Next Chapter. Tom Hagel was born and raised in Nebraska as well. In combat, he earned three Purple Hearts, the Bronze Star with a V for Valor, and the Combat Infantry Man Badge. He graduated from the University of Nebraska at Omaha and the University of Nebraska School of Law. After working as a public defender in Nebraska, he taught law at Temple University 
and then joined the University of Dayton, retiring as a full professor. In addition to his emeritus professor role, he serves as an acting judge for the Municipal Court in Dayton, Ohio. He's the author of two books and numerous articles on legal subjects. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Daniel Bolger, Chuck Hagel, and Tom Hagel. Thanks very much for that kind introduction, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out on this rainy election day to, uh, to spend some time uh, talking with the Hagel brothers. And uh, to my right, Chuck Hagel, and to his right, his brother, Tom. And um, to start off, I'd like to ask both of these gentlemen, 50 years ago, November 7th, 1967, where were you? Ben Foot, I think that's... Uh, no, not, not 1967. Oh, 67. 67. Right, 67. I can't remember that far back. <laughs> well, no, I was, um, uh, we were in uh, California at Fort Ord. We? There you go. We were both in Fort Ord, and I was getting ready to leave to go to Fort Dix, New Jersey, because I had orders to go to Germany. And you were finishing. Right. We were in it, uh, advanced uh, infantry training, uh, and uh, I, I followed Chuck uh, all the way through. I was about, what, four weeks, six weeks behind mm -hmm. you in the training cycle, both in uh, basic training and then uh, infantry training. And, and where did you do your basic training? In El Paso, both of us. Yeah, hot, Ford, yeah, Ford lovely Ford. place, if you yeah. like deserts, yeah. Fort Bliss, there's a, there's a reason they call it Bliss. Yeah. Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. <laughs> And so then by November 67, as you mentioned, you finishers, and you had orders to Germany. Now, of course, Cold War was going on then, ladies and gentlemen, so there was a substantial U.S. force in Germany, but of course, the Vietnam War was also going on. So did you ever go to Germany? No. Um, I got to Fort Dix, New Jersey in um, late November, and as the bus was uh, getting ready to pick up 10 of us, takes to Germany, and we were the first class of the red-eye missile gun, uh, which was the first shoulder-fired heat-seeking missile uh, in our arsenal. And it was designed to bring down low-flying jet coming in uh, MiGs from uh, the Soviet Union over the, uh, and through the Fulda Pass in Germany. And I decided if, if I was going to be in the Army and I was going to serve my country at a time we were, we were at war, then I wanted to go to Vietnam. So I went down, and uh, Tom will tell his story, but he did the same thing. Uh, and I said, I'm Private Hagel. Here are my orders to Germany. I want to volunteer to go to Vietnam. And I recall vividly in the orderly room, there was this uh, stunned silence. And they put me in the back of the room and said, son, come back here. They brought um, a chaplain in, and they brought, um, I think, uh, a security officer in, because immediately they thought something was very suspicious. I was running away from a crime or something was wrong. And uh, then eventually uh, I stayed there for two weeks, got new orders to go to Vietnam, went back home um, for a few days, and then went to California and processed out for Vietnam. And then. About oh, four weeks later, uh, I ended up in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, I remember riding from uh, the uh, airport, and the uh, back of an open uh, two-and-a-half-ton Army truck, uh, and it was freezing, uh, deep snow. Uh, and I remember driving by uh, the uh, PX, and I saw this poor guy, and, and this was about midnight, poor guy, uh, walking, he had a little trail around the PX, but now keep in mind, this is New Jersey, United States, not exactly a lot of enemy around, uh, with a rifle, which I'm sure was empty, uh, walking around the PX in his little trail with, I remember, a outdoor light glaring on him, and I'm, uh, I was thinking, my God, uh, I can't do that, and I'm supposed to go to Germany as well, and I had this thing about cold weather to begin with. <laughs> uh, and I just couldn't do that because uh, the, we were told, uh, our group were told that we we're going to spend, I think, about six months uh, living out in the black forest, running maneuvers in the snow in Germany, uh, and then go to Vietnam. 
which turned out, that my, I ran into a couple of my friends who did go over and I ran into them uh, in Vietnam. Uh, they were just getting over there. Uh, so I went and uh, volunteered to go too. Uh, they didn't call any security people or chaplains for me. They were happy to do that. And uh, uh, you know, keep in mind, I'm, what, 18 years old, something like that. And uh, I got it in my head that I remember seeing a movie about brothers, uh, you know, if you have two brothers and more brothers in a combat zone, they can only have one there and the rest uh, can go to a non-combat unit. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, uh, I'll go over and Chuck can come back. And they said, yeah, no problem, just get hold of uh, the Red Cross when you get there. <laughs> Keep in mind, I'm 18, I don't know anything from straight up. Uh, so I uh, went over there, landed, and went to the assignment center where they uh, divvy up the troops to the different units. And I said, well, where's the Red Cross? And uh, they pointed to some tent somewhere. And I walked in and told, well, you know, after all, my name's Tom Hagel. And, you know, you probably know all about this. And you're going to send Chuck, no, huh? Who are you? Well, obviously, <laughs> it didn't work. So we both ended up there. Yeah. And, but, and to follow on on that, um, both, both of the Hagel brothers were draftees, but um, in each of your cases, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the standard draft where you just get the note and you report in. Both of you, when contacted by the draft board, what action did you take? Well, I was called home. I had been to three colleges, and um, uh, not um, an academic career to be emulated uh, <laughs> at that point. And so uh, Alma Hasselbeck, who was the director of uh, Selective Service and had been the director during World War II, so she'd been there a long time. And the draft board at Platte County, Nebraska, said, we'll give you six months to get back into school, and then we're going to have to take you, because the levy was coming down. It was the big buildup. Uh, we, we had over a half a million troops in Vietnam when I got there, and they built that even bigger. But um, I just said, you know, I think it's a waste of time certainly for any respectable educational institution for me to go back. Uh, I'm not getting anything out of it. Um, how soon could I leave? I'll volunteer for the draft, but I want to go right now. I mean, <laughs> they looked at each other and they said, well, there's actually a bus leaving in two weeks. I said, put me on it. I signed up there, and that was, that was it. And then you were still in high school, right? Oh, yeah, I got my, uh, I took my physical and uh, got my draft notice while I was still in high school. And I was, uh, I, I got the same letter. Uh, and they said, well, we'll uh, send you in, I think it was September. And I was not going to sit around all summer with that hanging over my head. So I said, you know, just, I'll go now. And uh, I was uh, in the Army, I think, five days after high school. Mm. Well, and, and I mention that just because when we, you know, you'll often hear people say, well, the Army in Vietnam was a draft army, which was true, and the Army today is, is a volunteer army, also true. But here you have uh, two Vietnam veterans who, who were basically volunteered, even though officially their records show them as draftees. Now, there was one other opportunity both of you got. Um, if you want to comment what happened when your potential was recognized and you were recommended for officer candidate school. <laughs> and both Hegels had that opportunity, so <laughs> Well, um, I'll give you my take on it, and, and Tom had the same thing, but he'll have his story. Uh, I wasn't uh, particularly interested uh, in it because um, it meant another year, uh, and I, I wasn't sure that I wanted to take another year, and that's, that'd be three years. And the other thing that kept going through my mind uh, was the fact that our dad was in World War II and over in the South Pacific was a tail gunner in a B-25 bomber and uh, spent quite a, quite a bit of time there. And he was enlisted and came out a technical sergeant. And I don't know, there maybe was some romanticism about uh, our dad or his service or being a sergeant, but uh, I think that subconsciously affected me a little bit too. But I think the main thing for me was I just didn't want to commit to that third year. I didn't know how that was all going to work. And so I, I, I said no. Uh, when uh, I was offered it, uh, I keep in mind, once again, I'm 18 years old, not too bright. Uh, and I'm sitting there thinking, I learned very quickly 
that officers had a lot better life to lead than being an enlisted man, especially the, the low private E1 that I was at the time. Uh, so they explained to me it's a 52-week program. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, uh, and, and, and by the way, both of us uh, had to go through uh, uh, advanced infantry training to be able to and then go into officer's candidate school. So no matter how it shook down, we were going to be trained as infantrymen, which is fine. But I'm sitting there thinking, okay, uh, uh, basic training lasts so long, uh, advanced infantry training lasts so long, and it's a year uh, in officer's candidate school, and I had to figure it out that, well, if I do that, by the time I get out of officer's candidate school, I'm only going to have about six months left. I thought, you know, this isn't a bad deal, so I went along with it until uh, I finished uh, infantry training and they got to the group together to uh, take off for, I think it was Fort Benning is where they mm -hmm. trained at. And they said, well, we want to go through this one more time. Uh, keep in mind, and the, the key part is, keep in mind that the 52 weeks that you spend there doesn't count against the two, two years <laughs> you're already in for. And I said, well, forget it. So I refused to go. Uh, so it was probably in everybody's best interest. So two brothers, both volunteered for the Army, volunteered again for the infantry, and, um, and Tom, I think at one point they, they didn't want to put you in the infantry. Chuck's mentioned being a red-eye gunner, which was an infantry specialty at that time, but Tom, didn't they, I thought the, the, after they did the initial screening, they, they actually recommended you for another possible specialty. I can't remember that. Well, I believe it was, and I've seen your records, I believe it was Cook. Yes. Oh, well, no, what, what that was <laughs> is that uh, I had had a ton of jobs. I spent much more of my life as a teenager working than I did in high school, and if you saw my record, you'd understand why. Uh, but one of the jobs I've had uh, was uh, pizza maker, cook, things like that. And when I refused to go to officer's camp school, they didn't know what to do with me because my orders were already cut. Uh, so uh, they sent me back to the training unit and made me a cook for about a month uh, and then cut me new orders for Germany. Uh, and, and the rest is history, as they say. As they say. Culinary arts. Yes. Culinary <laughs> arts, that's right. The, the I can still <laughs> keep about 20 eggs going at one time without burning any of them. So. There you go. Impressive. And, and, you know, your comment about work, and um, one thing you should note, the Hegel brothers were raised in Nebraska, which is almost in the exact geographical center of the continental United States, and um, raised out in the Sand Hills, which is a very rural area. And both of you gentlemen, you mentioned work. Both of you, both of you guys worked from a very young age, as I recall. In, in fact, Chuck was nine and I was seven when we got our first job together in a grocery store. Uh, sacking potatoes and uh, ice, all this is manual of course, uh, 10 pound bags for two cents a bag, and that was big money back then. You know, I was looking, uh, and I think I mentioned this to you, Tom, uh, uh, you know how the Social Security system works, so you get, I think, an annual review of how much you've paid in and when you started paying in. And I was looking at mine the other day, and I started paying into Social Security when I was eight years old. Right. When I was eight years old. And I remember the job. It was at a drive-in. It was next oh, to, right. to, uh, the, grocery the, store. to the grocery yeah. store out in Rushville, Nebraska. I was a car hop. And I had to take a little box out because I wasn't tall enough to get up to the window and stand on the box to take the order. And it's, it, I always look back on that as to why they would have taken Social Security out. Because I, I think I only... Uh, I probably made enough money to buy a hot dog, and that was that was it. But, but anyway, that's when I started paying. So we we've worked all our lives, at, like Tom said, at probably every job that that they have. No, I think I think that's good, and that work ethic, of course, would help you during your military service, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, so both these gentlemen arrived in Vietnam. Um, Chuck got there in December. Tom got there as mentioned in January, and initially you were both in the in the same division, the 9th Infantry Division, but that's a big organization, ladies and gentlemen. That's like 20,000 troops, but not the same um, unit, not the same battalion or company right. initially. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, that's a, I, Tom and I still don't understand all that, how that happened, uh, because as you say, he was up north within Colonel Patton's the Cav, uh, Cav, yeah. Cav, Cav, and I was with uh, 2nd 47th, and we, tried to 
put in for transfer to see if we could get together. We talked, I think, a couple of times on the phone once you got there. But one day Tom appeared uh, <laughs> in our unit, which is still a kind of a mysterious. Because well, they were just going to send me somewhere south to be somewhere around. Uh, but, uh, and of course, one of the intervening events there was kind of important, and that was um, not within a few days after Tom arrived in country, the, the most, the largest enemy offensive of the war broke out on January 30, 31st, 1968, the, the Tet Offensive. Right. And both you gentlemen were involved in that, right? Yeah, I got there in, uh, I landed on December 4th, 1967. And of course, Tet was, what, January 30th? Yes. The end of January. Um, and uh, I mean, that, as you said, was a defining time for that war, for the optics of it, and for the casualties. And those who have had an opportunity to look at Ken Burns' magnificent documentary, I think get some historical reflection on, on what really happened uh, about that. It's, it's still being debated and so on. But um, that, that really did define, I think, our service, Tom, in in Vietnam, and it defined everything. Kind of the after. direction of it. Absolutely, yeah, and it defined the war. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Absolutely. The turning point in America, politically and in every way. And, and for the rest of, of your time, particularly in public service, you kept a picture from, from that time. What, what yeah. was that picture? Well, Tom knows about this. Uh, Tom was not with me at the time when, uh, that this happened, but um, when I was in the Senate, and I think you met him, Tom. Um, I got a letter one day from a retired Army colonel in Wisconsin who I remembered the, the name. I think it was Duretsky. Um, and I, I couldn't put it all together, but it was a very nice letter. And he, and he said, Dear Senator, I don't know if you remember this or remember me, but I was a lieutenant in the, in the same company, not the same platoon, and we were a mechanized unit, uh, armored personnel carriers. We were the first unit into Westmoreland's headquarters that morning, Widow's Village. And, and uh, he said, I took a picture with my little brownie Instamatic camera. I was behind your track uh, of the ammo dump in Long Bend, which was the largest in the world, blowing up. And um, he said, I'd like to come by when I'm in town and give it to you. So we, we set up a time that he came by when I was in the Senate and uh, had a long conversation. And he gave me an 8 by 10 picture, this little brownie instamatic camera picture. It looked like an atomic bomb going off. I mean, everything, the skies, it, it just was astounding. Then he autographed it for me. And I've kept that on my wall. Then the rest of the time in the Senate and when I was Secretary of Defense, I have it in my office at Gallup uh, uh, as well. So it was, it's a reminder which Tom and I have discussed many times about, again, the, the significance of Tet. Right, and the scale of, of the destruction. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, because all this, ladies and gentlemen, for, for Chuck Hagel's unit at the time, he, they were in and around the city of Saigon, the largest city in South Vietnam and the capital of South Vietnam. Today, sometimes called Ho Chi Minh City, that's its post-war name, but, uh, but the people living there mm -hmm. still seem to call it Saigon, from what I can tell. Mm -hmm. And, um, and how about you, Dwayne? Well, I was in Long Bend. Uh, I was in a uh, replacement uh, unit, and they came in and said, uh, how many of you have uh, a infantry MOS? And collected us and put us on the perimeter. Uh, so we were involved in it from uh, trying to keep them out uh, of the Long Bend uh, base. It was a huge base. And then uh, I think after a couple days, that's when I got orders to go uh, to uh, 3rd and 5th Cavalry up on the DMZ and up there was just as crazy. And, and most people, when you, if you've watched the Ken Burns special or if you are familiar, served in Vietnam or know people who did, the North was the area where um, it was right next to the, the so called demilitarized zone with North Vietnam. So all the North Vietnamese regular troops, their best troops, filtered down through that area. Mm -hmm. The Marines had a lot of uh, forces up there as well. And, and you were up there. Yeah, we worked with the Marines. With the Marines yeah. Yeah. It was a um, tank unit. Yeah, so major fighting at that time was occurring where Tom Eagle's unit was in places you've probably heard about like Hue City and Khe Sanh. That whole area was, 
was all under attack during the, the Tet period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, so you mentioned you both, you both sent in a request to serve together. Whatever yeah. happened with the, the Red Cross idea that if you, could, <laughs> if you could get in country, they'd send Chuck home? Believe me, they never got back to me. So. Yes, <laughs> shockingly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, this is one thing where it helps when you're the author and it's, it's decades later and you can actually dig up the actual paperwork. So here's what I found. Um, there is not only a regulation within the Department of Defense that, that Secretary De former Secretary of Defense Hagel would know about, but it's also a, a United States law that was passed after World War II. Some of you all may have seen the movie The Fighting Sullivans or heard of the five Sullivan brothers from Iowa. In World War II, those five brothers all enlisted in the Navy and served together on the light cruiser USS Juno. And the USS Juno was torpedoed by the Japanese off the island of Guadalcanal during a night action. And many of the crew was, were lost, including all five of the Sullivan brothers. And it was so devastating for the Sullivan family. And, and by the way, our Navy in World War II named a destroyer the Sullivans. Mm -hmm. There's a destroyer today, a new Arleigh Burke class destroyer called the Sullivan. So they've been memorialized throughout, throughout our country's history. A movie was made during World War II called The Fighting Sullivans. But lawmakers after the war said, hey, they, we can't let this happen again. So they passed a law that became colloquially known as the <coughs> Sullivan's Rule. And this law said that two close family members cannot serve together in a combat zone voluntar or involuntarily. And that last part is the key part. Because both Hagel brothers had asked to serve with each other, guess what the sergeants and officers said when they got those? Does the Sullivan rule apply? Nope. Set that aside. And the next thing you know. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and because you volunteered to do it. And I might add, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, what was really unusual about Chuck and Tom, they didn't just serve together in a large 20,000 person outfit. They were in the same rifle platoon, which is about 30 to 40 soldiers all together at the same time. Um, so they really served close together. I mean, mm -hmm. next to each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when, you, when your brother showed up, what did, what did you think? Well, I was concerned when they, we were out on a uh, <clears throat> search and destroy mission for about four days and they pulled me back into the base camp. And uh, when I asked what's going on, I mean, my first thought was something's happened to Tom. Um, and I remember explicitly the, uh, the captain saying, son, if we wanted you to know, we'd tell you. Uh, and that was kind of the order of the day. I mean, uh, it, it's the way it was. I said, okay. So I waited in my, in my tent, and a few hours went by, and the next thing I know, I look up, Tom walks in with his duffel bag. Um, and the rest is history. So Exactly right. And the, yeah. and the first sergeant had, had told you that if your brother ever got assigned, he was going to put him right in your platoon, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So there, yeah. so there they were. Now, what did you write and tell your mother about that arrangement? You were the one that did all the writing. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't surprise anybody. Well, I always signed Tom's name, yeah. for, forge it, but uh, my mothers know the difference. Yes, they do. Uh, but Tom did his, his share, though, of it, uh, uh, in the communications part. But uh, um, I think Mom felt that if we were going to be over there and in that war, it probably, if both of us wanted it this way, it was better to be there together, maybe taking care of each other and that kind of thing. I think, don't you, Tom? I think that's you, a fair one. Yeah. yeah, I think that's what she... Yeah. And, uh, you know, the outfit that, they, that the brothers ended up with, Chuck already mentioned this, it was a mechanized unit, which means to say they had small vehicles that would look to you or I maybe like a little tank, but it had people in it rather than a big gun on top. It had tracks called an M113, and the soldiers were were in the back being carried around that had machine guns on top. And that unit was, was basically a response unit, a fire brigade, what today we call a quick reaction force. All the, uh, anything that was really a hot situation, your outfit rolled on and, and had to go very quickly. They even had a, they had a, uh, a siren in, in the motor pool they'd play, you know, when it was time to, to everybody mount up and go if it was an emergency. But many, many of the operations, all the roads around, around Saigon were, of course, mine, booby trapped, ambushed, and their outfit had the responsibility to clear them and to clear the villages around there. And, and, and so it was that um, a, a very 
fateful day for you two gentlemen. On the 28th of March of 1968, you were both out on a mission when about midday something happened. What happened? Well, we were on a search and destroy mission in the jungle. And Tom and I, uh, like we uh, often did, walk point. And, and if, if just a second here, you, ladies and gentlemen, when he says walk point, that means there's a long column of men. The first two guys are the Hegel brothers. Mom didn't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> she had other issues yeah. that she we, could, uh, we could tell her about. But um, I think Tom and I just felt, and I, and I think our, our platoon leaders and company commanders felt that uh, we could do a pretty good job on that, and I think we felt that we could do it better than anybody else. Uh, Tom, Tom was the best I, I truly ever saw in sensing things. I mean, he saved uh, me, he saved the company many times on spotting things. I could, uh, I could read a map pretty well. And use a compass. And a compass. Now today, when you ask somebody about a compass, it's all yeah, computerized. It's, so you're GPS, about, the phone. You know? you t you're talking about shooting an azimuth. Right. Yes. People yeah. are like, well, are you talking dirty, or what do you mean, shooting an azimuth? And no, that's what you did. Is you know, you shoot your azimuth on which direction you go in the compass. You relied on your compass. Well, it's not that way anymore. Anyway, I could do that pretty well. So could Tom. But we made a pretty good team doing that. And, and on this particular day, we had been. Uh, up on point most of, of the day. And if you're on point too, you're, you're chopping a lot. Right. Uh, especially the point guy, which would be normally Tom. And I'd be right there with him, behind him with the compass and the map. But you're usually with a machete, you're chopping because you're off the roads all the time. And um, the, the company commander rotated us out of the, uh, out of the, the lead uh, point position to give us a break and, and put uh, another few guys up in front of us. And we were uh, crossing a stream, and we tried to always stay off the roads or, or any path for obvious reasons because the booby traps were everywhere. And uh, the top, the, the point guys, which Tom and I had just been those guys, hit a tripwire in the water. And there were claymore mines in the trees, and claymore mines are essentially mines that are filled with pellets right. and, uh, and uh, like BBs, but, but high explosives, uh, and do some pretty da pretty rough damage, and hit uh, all those front guys, and they hit Tom and they hit me. Um, uh, that's that's what happened uh, on on that day, and we we uh, and I always look at look for his name as Tom does too on the wall, Robert Summers, yes. the, the point guy who was killed, and then they had to get the severely wounded out and, the, and, our, and Summers out in the basket because the helicopters had to come and then drop the basket down into the jungle. And the jungle is very dense and then we, you know, you don't know if the snipers are, normally snipers would open up, you didn't know what that, it, it could be a trap bringing a helicopter in and so on, but we eventually got the severely wounded out and summers out, and then we had to get out. Um, and and you're both wounded now. This, this is something wounded. important to, to point and, out here. Right? Uh, so it was it was getting to be nighttime, yeah. and as the old saying goes, the night belongs to Charlie, the Viet Cong, and you didn't you didn't never want to be in the jungle at night. I mean, it was without some protection and so on. So we had to get out of there, and so. The company commander asked Tom and I to go back on point and get us out. And, and so we started to move again after this was uh, the wounded taken out, the one KIA taken out, and so on and so on. And we got a few steps into it. Tom was walking again point, and he stopped, and he, he caught, saw a grenade hanging in a tree. And I didn't see it, and uh, he saw it. and we were able to neutralize the, uh, and get around, and we finally got out, but it was, it was dark. And yeah. even in the middle of the afternoon, it's dark. Yeah. Because of the canopy of the, right. the yeah. triple forest. canopy. Yeah. yeah. So very, very tricky. So both, both brothers earned the Purple Heart the only way you can earn it, the hard way, uh, that day. And um, to this day, uh, when you go through the, the uh, 
the TSA at the airport, they, they find things, right? Well, I've got, um, I don't know if Tom's still got a little shrapnel on him. I, I have a couple of pieces still up in my chest because when they took us, and we went in the field hospital and they dug stuff out, and fortunately it was, you know, it was, it was significant, but not that significant. Um, um, so they got the stuff out of me. It was, it was more surface, but I've still got a couple of pellets still in my, in my chest. So it's more when I take a X-ray or yeah, like a chest MRA chest or something like that. You know, you got to tell them because, I, because those things show up. And, and uh, but it's never given me any trouble. And I don't. I think Tom's probably yeah, right. Uh, mine got out too. It just took a while. Right. Yeah, that well, worked its way out. And it, that's 50 years later. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Now, even though wounded, uh, both of these soldiers um, went back to their unit. The thing, I, the thing I might also mention is uh, Chuck and Tom are young men at this time. They are not senior experienced NCOs with 10 years in service or anything like that. But the role they describe, that point role, is normally in today's Army, that would be done by a, a relatively mm -hmm. experienced pair of sergeants. Mm -hmm. Now, they became sergeants, but they became sergeants in combat by doing those type of missions and really mm -hmm. had to take charge of, of the other young men who were with them because you were willing to do it, you had the skills. So you went back to your unit. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then about a month later, what happened when you went in a village on the tracks on the armored personnel carrier? No. Mm -hmm. um, I think they got intelligence that uh, the VC had entered a village, if I remember right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we were sent out to sweep the village to find out if there were any VC there, swept the village, came back, were on our tracks, and the way uh, the tracks are the APCs, the armored personnel carriers. And uh, since uh, we were always the first track out, uh, we were always the last track in. And of course, since they're track vehicles, you can do a 360 turn. And so uh, again, we were the first ones out, so everybody, when they came back to the tracks, loaded back up. Uh, and then they did the 180 degree turn to come back in and all the other tracks uh, were in front of us, got past it, but since we were the last track, we ran over a mine. Uh, and Chuck was, I think, most seriously injured. And, uh, I was injured. Yeah, no, Tom was injured. I, I thought Tom was dead, actually. He was, he was the radio operator on, in, on the 550 caliber machine gun. Up on, on top. top of the vehicle. Yeah, and uh, when that concussion hit, I mean, it, it uh, well, obviously disabled the track and fires broke out because those tracks were full of ammunition and they would blow. And I was on the side and so I, my face was burnt bad and so on, and, and, but I started looking at everybody else on the track. Some guys had been blown off and Tom was slumped over the 50 caliber. He had blood coming out of his ears and nose, and he was unconscious. And um, so we, we got him off the track because the snipers were everywhere, and like Tom said, they were, the other tracks were way ahead of us. We were all alone. And um, fires started to break out. And so I didn't know if he was dead or uh, what had happened to him, but we got him off the track, and, and that's when they, they took us out by helicopter right. that night on medevac and to a field hospital. And Both Chuck's face uh, looked like it was bubbled on this side of the skin. Fast and all that coming out. Right. Pretty gross. Yeah, and, and, and now, so again, second set of Purple Hearts for both brothers, um, second time wounded, and you went back to your unit. In fact, when you went back, you were all wrapped up. Yeah, I looked like a mummy. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my face was all bandaged, and I had to put salve and everything. Remember, even Tom had to help me. Uh, and I've often thought about it. If, if it hadn't been my brother, how many other infantrymen would have uh, come to a different conclusion? Yeah, right? about <laughs> taking care of me. Uh, but Tom did take care of me, and uh, so he'd have to rebandage me every day because infections. I got infections in my face too because it was so filthy it's and jungle, and, hot, yeah. humid. And so they had to put salve on my face, and but Tom did all that. He was the medic too, <laughs> and he had been pretty seriously hurt. But we were in the field hospital. I don't know for a couple of days or yeah, so on. And I, I don't remember then, it happening, uh, and I don't even remember being in the hospital. Yeah, I just remember being checked out. 
and, and went back to the unit. And then we mentioned the Tet Offensive. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong launched a second wave of attacks in May of 1968. Um, the soldiers, you, you guys called it mini Tet, but it was heavily focused in Saigon. So the call went out again to 2nd and 47th, um, their outfit and Company B, their company, to, uh, to intervene, but in the city, for city fighting. Both you guys rolled on that mission as well. Tom really, that's right. But Tom had the, the bulk of that because I think right. where I was, I, I think I was at the NCO Academy. You were, and so roll right into that. Uh, it was totally different than anything uh, I certainly had experienced, or our unit had experienced, because we were always out in the field and jungles and rice paddies and that, but this was inside the city of Saigon and street-to-street uh, -street fighting. It was just uh, uh, chaos. And uh, you have people shooting at you from uh, every different direction. You can't uh, see where most of it's coming from. And uh, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Saigon, you ought to take it because it's, an, believe it or not, an incredibly beautiful city. Uh, so much of the architecture is from the French colonial period. So you had uh, multi-story buildings. Uh, with balconies and what have you, and they would have machine guns and that set up on it. And it was, I mean, just absolute chaos. But uh, it worked out. It, it did. But yeah. I might add, I mean, he's, he's being very yes, uh, he, humble he, here. He's uh, cutting a few parts out. Yeah, I mean, he was awarded the Bronze Star with a V for Valor, and he was wounded a third time. And the mission that he had, that they gave him, was our battalion commander yes. got shot down, who happened to be the brother-in-law of General Westmoreland. And uh, it was Colonel Frederick Van Dusen, yes. who had just come on as our new just battalion commander. That's right. yeah. And uh, he was killed, and they were trying to rescue him. And I think it was at Saigon River. And so, right. so Tom, uh, Tom played a pretty big role in, in all right. of that. Right. I mean, it, it, absolutely. And, and I think that's one key thing that one key thing that, to remember is that, you know, Westmoreland, you know, he was a human too. You know, he had, you know, they think of these generals, presidents, that they don't have anybody. They're, the country was involved, and Westmoreland's brother-in-law was in your outfit. Right. Well, he came, if you remember, Tom, Westmoreland had just gone back to Washington as chief of staff of the Army. Right. And Creighton Abrams had taken over. Uh, and he, Westmoreland, came back to lead the search himself right. for his brother-in-law. Because he couldn't find his body. Yeah, it was one of the many that were missing in action. They did eventually mm -hmm. recover it, mm -hmm. and, and Tom was heavily involved in that, that particular fighting around that episode. Yeah, they found his body with about three other people still in the helicopter at the bottom of the in river. In the river, yeah, yeah. in the river. Horrible. Um, one other thing before we do questions, I'd like to get your gentleman's perspective on. Things back home affected the soldiers who were deployed over there. 1968 was a very divisive year in the United States. One of the most tragic events of that year occurred on April 4th, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee, when an assassin killed Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That reverberated over to Vietnam. What was the effect of that killing in your unit? Mm -hmm. First of all, there was a certain amount of segregation uh, in uh, the Army then, even though it was apparently against the law. Uh, but it was, I think, more of self-segregation. Uh, but I know in our unit, we never had any problems. Uh, the, the, we had uh, people from every ethnic group uh, serving together. Everybody got along. And part of it is, is because of the nature of the unit, you had to rely on each other. So, you know, there's no place for uh, prejudice, racism, and that. But after the news came that uh, Dr. King was killed, uh, there was a separate, uh, kind of a almost automatic, immediate separation of races into different sides, literally different sides of the camp. Uh, we lived on a fire support base. And there was a lot of tension and a lot of anger floating around. And, uh, and of course, that, what that does to a unit, uh, you, know, you don't know, you know if you can trust the same buddy that you had before. Uh, so uh, we were lucky enough to have an uh, officer African-American officer who addressed it. You want to talk about that? Well, well, Tom framed it up exactly right. And the racial tension was, was palpable. Um, and because we had officers rotating in and out a lot, partly 
sometimes mainly because they had been killed or, or seriously injured. Um, we uh, got a new company commander, uh, as Tom said, a young, I think he was 21 or 22 yeah. years old, African-American lieutenant from Chicago by the name of Jerome Johnson. And um, he grabbed a hold of the racial issue. Um, straight up. Straight up. And said, no more. We're going to integrate the tents again. No more black tents, white tents. We're going to be a unit. We're going to fight together, take care of each other. And he, he truly exhibited leadership that I have rarely seen in, in, in a very difficult situation. He was threatened by both sides of the equation, and he faced him down. And um, to this day, Tom and I have now found him uh, over the last few years and reestablished our friendship. And I think Tom and I both feel that uh, he's an individual that we've had such immense respect for over the years and often thought of him. But it, it was a tough time, as Tom said. Uh, it, was, it was difficult. And, uh, and a lot of units didn't have uh, good fortune we did to have him. And there was uh, people, uh, stories of people shooting each other and fragging, uh, throwing grenades into yeah. right. Uh, so this this was at a time too when America was becoming more and more divided. Then Bobby Kennedy was killed, and the convention, the Democratic convention, and it was really coming apart. And that was being reflected certainly in in the, these. 19, 20 year old kids having to fight this war that they didn't understand, that America wasn't supporting. And you're, you're going to just bring out every ugly dimension of a society when you've got that. And this is one of the reasons I've always thought, Tom and I have talked about this many times. Uh, the Vietnam generation, these kids that were asked to go over there and fight, um, really, when you back up and look at it all, uh, acquitted themselves pretty well. I mean, really, in, in a very difficult time, and handled it uh, in, I think, a really pretty magnificent way with all the other problems that they had to deal with, aside from the fact that they were in the middle of a war. Yeah. And I, I often think to contrast that time with uh, what we've been going through what the last 15 years with these idiotic wars over in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan that we're still involved in. Uh, one good thing, it was a, a massive mistake to ever get involved in those two wars, uh, mm -hmm. but one good thing that uh, came out of it, I think, is that now American society uh, can look at the people who are uh, sent to fight a war separately from the war. You can be against the war, uh, but still support your troops. Mm -hmm. but, and, but think about it in, uh, in our situation. Here you have uh, young guys, uh, and in fact, when I got out of Vietnam, and this is even after I extended my tour there. Even after I got out, I had to wait almost a year to legally buy a drink. I was that young. <laughs> it didn't mean I didn't it get to it. I got to it. There's ways of working around that. Yeah. You couldn't vote then. That's yeah. right. I couldn't vote. Uh, but imagine uh, you are uh, involved in a war, especially in, if you have a combat role, and everything you hear through the we didn't have a lot of access to media now, but everything you hear from the United States is how the war is evil and your baby killers and all that kind of stuff. And you're sitting there going, you know, what am I doing with my life? I'm putting it out on the, here you know, any day now I could get killed. And what am I doing it for? Because all the people back home uh, you would hope would support your efforts and respect you for, but it was totally different than that. Uh, yeah. Where nowadays, at least uh, there, from what I see, there's a lot of support for troops coming home as there should be. Yeah, that, that was one thing we, we got right. Yes. Because of mm -hmm. your sacrifices and those yeah. who fought alongside of you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for some questions, and I know there's microphones on either side, so if you want to ask a question of either the Hagel brothers um, or myself, just please line up at the mic. Yes, sir. I think this is on. There we go. Yeah, it's on. All right. Um, I was curious, as best as you can recall, um, any political aspects that you recall, and what I mean by that is in a, in, in a troop or patrol, um, you've got people that are very young, they're experiencing life from the best that they can. You've got people above them that are telling them to do things that are life and death, that are very young, they're trying to do the best that they can. And you've got 
an aspect of, you know, like today, everybody has needs and wants and desires. And what were the dynamics of being in a group like that, all being and sharing, trying to protect yourself, protect them, protect, protect each other, but also from a political aspect, from a combat, combat perspective, anything you can recall or recollect on that? Go ahead. I, I'll, I'll... I don't recall really having any uh, in-depth political discussions. And for one, one of the reasons, I think, is that uh, keep in mind how old we were. Uh, I was basically a, a ignorant 18-year-old kid. I barely graduated from high school. Uh, and I didn't know anything about international politics, diplomacy, affairs, economics, things like that. Uh, and I don't recall getting it into any serious political discussions, uh, liberal versus conservative, and it, I, I probably couldn't even tell you what that meant. Let me elaborate, I'm sorry. The perspective of, hey, if I get on the Sarge's good side, I get more at dinner, oh, or I don't get oh, in points, politics. or if I do this, I get an award, and oh, maybe yeah. gets me out, anything like that, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I don't remember, first of all, the, uh, the idea of, <laughs> if I do this, I'll get an award, that never crosses your mind. Yeah, I, yeah, people I, don't really compete for the Purple Heart. No, no. There's not a lot of people standing in line for that. No, you, it means you just got in the way. You know, I, uh, I think Tom's right. I, I, uh, I saw some things, and Tom did too, where there were some people well. fabricating valorous actions which didn't occur to get awards. Uh, I'm not sure that was unique to Vietnam. I think it happens in every war. And they were usually uh, higher ups, uh, not. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, the guy on the bottom, he just trying to survive, quite frankly. And um, so I, I think Tom's, Tom's right on that. But I, I think I would just add this. When you're in those situations, and as Tom said, you're young, and many of the young people we served with didn't even have high school degrees. I mean, it, it could hardly read. Uh, it's all about survival and taking care of each other. I mean, that, that's where you are. You are. It's where your head is. That's where everything. And, and you're not uh, too interested in anything beyond that. You just want to get in, get your job, your and get out. Your worldview is so narrow and confined just to your life situation. And, and keep in mind how close... Uh, you are when you're in a unit like that. Uh, we slept together, ate together, uh, did all personal functions together. There was no privacy whatsoever. I mean, uh, you're probably closer on a day-to-day -day basis than you have ever been with your family. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go to the restroom at home, uh, you close the door. There weren't any doors, and there weren't any restrooms. Uh, I mean, you did everything together, so you got to know each other in and out, and that's uh, that, that's good on one hand, but on the other hand, when something happens, yeah. Any, any other questions? Okay. Okay. First, I wanted to just thank you both for your service to our country. And thank you. Appreciate thank you. you. This is um, for Secretary Hagel. I just wondered, um, did your time in Vietnam and your service there lead you into your political career? It, did that have a bearing on it, or did you think you would have just gone in anyway and, and gone down that path? Well, I don't think my service in Vietnam uh, directly led me into um, a political career. Uh, it, it affected my thinking, it, surely because uh, of what's politics about uh, and uh, what's elected representative government about, accountable, responsible leadership. And uh, I think everybody now knows we didn't have that from top to bottom in the Vietnam War. And it cost thousands and thousands of innocent lives. Uh, so sure, I was affected by that experience. I don't think it directly led me into that. I was fortunate that I'd had a, a pretty good career before I got to the Senate and all the other things I, I had done, but I always had an interest in politics and always felt, and Tom knows this, that 
if if things would be a, aligned, family, business opportunities, maybe in the right way that I would be very interested in, in, in doing something in politics. But I could have finished my life uh, without any of that, too. Uh, I'm glad I did all of it. It has been tremendously rewarding. It's been a tremendous privilege. But it, it helped me, the Vietnam War and that experience, like Tom said about experiences, because it defined a lot of my thinking, and especially when I got to be Secretary of Defense. Um, I always came at everything from the bottom up, not the top down. And um, it didn't mean I'm right or wrong, doesn't mean I'm smarter than anybody else, but that was my experience, and I, I tried to always see it that way. I did the same thing in the Senate. So it affected me, but it didn't direct me into politics. But I, I think, I hope it helped me. And I, I, I hope it may be a better, a better leader. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, there's been some polling recently that talks about the divisions in the country being similar to, to the Vietnam era. And I'm curious about how you see that, if you agree with that, and, and what you think the reasons may be. What are the things that are dividing us now, and how do they compare with what was going on in that time? Yeah. Tom, you want to start? <clears throat> Yes, um, you, know, our, you look at the history of our country and there's always been dissent uh, and specifically when it comes to issues of war and peace, there's always been protest movements. You can go back to the Civil War, the draft riots, uh, World War I, the isolationists, all of this. Um, but Americans always seem to come back to uh, equilibrium. Um, but. Uh, it was different, I think, with the Vietnam generation and the Vietnam War in particular. First of all, it came at a time when you had the Civil Rights Movement, which is, was no small thing historically. But uh, one thing for sure that I think defines that is that that was the first time, uh, from my reading of history, and I could be wrong on this, that uh, a massive number of citizens lost faith in the institutions of government and the mm -hmm. leaders of government because it, they were lied to for so long uh, that they didn't trust anybody. Uh, and I think that is a hangover. I, I think uh, the last election is a good example of, keep in mind, these are people who are our age, who are the highest group of people who vote demographically, and our children's age. And uh, it seems like we've lost that trust in government institutions and leaders, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, We've been lied to for so long. I, don't, I think the institutions are all right. It's just the people who run them. Uh, and I think a, a lot of, regardless of what you think of President Trump, I think a lot of the vote for him was a vote of uh, representing that. You know, we, we distrust our institutions. We distrust the government, both, both political parties. And we're angry, and we just want to smash it. Uh, so in a way, uh, I think that uh, Chickens have come home to roost because our uh, current uh, politicians too often, uh, I don't trust them either. I think they continue to lie to us, uh, but we've allowed ourselves to be lied to and reelect them all the time. Uh, they forgot that they work for us. We're citizens. We run the show. That's our responsibility as citizens. They work for us, but for some reason we, as a society we've lost that, uh, and uh, we just let it go on. Uh, and uh, so consequently, I think a lot of the distrust of the governmental institutions and, and the political system, and again, both parties, uh, can be tracked back to, uh, as a beginning point, the Vietnam War, uh, because it was so clear after a while, uh, especially with all the archives that, uh, and the materials that have been released and that, where, they, where the society uh, and, the, and the troops were lied to, blatantly lied to, about the Vietnam War, uh, the causes of it, the attempts to stop it, all of that, that uh, so many people lost faith and still have not uh, regained it. I, I think Tom's uh, put his finger on the, the breakdown in trust in our institutions and our leaders, and I think it has produced the kind of political environment we have today, uh, the deep divisions, the wide divisions. Uh, I would add one uh, additional point to that, and that is, uh, on a broader scale, 
I think we are seeing a new world order uh, being defined today and built. Uh, a world order that is different from the 10 years after World War II that America essentially led with our allies in, in building. It's a world order of the last 70 years. It's, it's been pretty good for most people. Uh, no World War III, no nuclear exchange, more fr people are free, more economic opportunity, more economic diffusion around the world. The, the problems that, that that world order didn't uh, face, can't do everything, is the trouble spots in the world today. How that relates to American politics, I think, it's, it's confusing because everybody in this room, I suspect, and most people watching te television, was born, <clears throat> uh, they were born during World War II or after World War II. Um, and, and what does that mean? That means that our world has been a world in America has dominated everything, and essentially everybody. And that world is shifting now and changing, and, it, and, and it's, it's presenting a lot of new dimensions and dynamics and challenges that we've not ha ever had before. I think Tom's point about when then you add that reality, uh, and doesn't mean it's bad or good, by the way. It, it, it's how you respond to it and how you adjust to it. But you add to the, the fundamental of what Tom's talking about, when you break down the trust and confidence of your governing institutions in a society, you're in trouble. And it's not just government, it's not just politics. Uh, Gallup does a poll every year, has been for the last 16 years. They take the 15 major institutions in this country, and they ask the question of confidence and trust. The military over the last few years is the only one that is, is anywhere near above the 50 percent line. It's, I think this year was 76 percent. The only other one over 50 percent was small business because everybody likes small business because that's the man and the woman in your hometown, you can trust them. But everybody else, big business, lawyers, politicians, pharmaceuticals, the media, organized education, organized religion are all down in the 20s and 30s. And of course, the politicians in Washington are down in the single digits. So when you've got a situation like that, you've got, you've got a real problem. You've got a real, real problem. Again, when you add that to the real challenges out in the world today that, that we've got to adjust to, whether they're trade issues, economic issues, security issues, terrorism issues, alliance issues, whatever, if you've got a government that's not functioning, and we've really pretty much had a dysfunctional government the last few years. I mean, we can't even pass budgets or appropriations bills. I mean, the most basic responsibility of government. Then, then you're, you're going to have what Tom was referring to, this tremendous um, outburst uh, and reaction out there in the populace that things are really bad and are going wrong. And it, it breaks down a structure, which, which is not good. I think Tom's point, though, how he started, is right. I prefer to believe I'm always an optimist, I guess, but I don't think a blind optimist, uh, I think I'm a realist, too, that we do balance out. America does self-correct. And Tom used the term that we find an equilibrium. We always have. Doesn't mean we always will, but we have. And I think the reason for that is we are a nation of laws. We have a constitution, and we have, we have a people. Uh, that make up our society that are so much better than what they're seeing today and I think the leaders who represent our institutions are showing. On that note, with great conclusion, thank you very much to both the Hegel brothers thank and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. For thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.